online and we'll get started. So good evening everybody, welcome to tonight's Top Talk guest session. Hi Brett, how are you doing? Very good, thank you for having me Jay, it's very right. cool to be here once again. It's great to have you back, I think it was this time last year. So uh, yeah, it's the and this run year. up to uh, the societies again, yeah. Absolutely, and flown by Brett, flown by, it just seems like, uh, just seems like it was just yesterday. <laughs> This is brilliant. It's quite appropriate, uh, you know, with uh, in terms of the topic for tonight. So yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, Brett, just before I hand you over the screen and we get into tonight's presentation, just for people who might not be familiar with you, just tell us a little bit about obviously your journey into photography. Obviously, I'm aware of it, which I thought was quite interesting, especially yeah. you know uh, how you got into it with the police. <laughs> obviously, want you to yeah. interact with Brett, so I'm going to share the, his social links with you as well, and obviously the convention. Yeah. So, yeah, just tell us a little bit about how you got started and how you moved into photography. Well, well, thank you, Jay. Um, it, it wasn't really uh, at that conventional introduction into photography. Uh, I was uh, a policeman uh, during the apartheid era uh, in, in uh, South Africa, as you can hear from my accent, I'm, I'm South African, uh, and literally was thrown in the deep end with regards to uh, the photography aspect of things. Um, I volunteered uh, or, or was volunteered to uh, head up the uh, photographic unit which started in the riot unit uh, primarily because uh, the photographers from the forensic department uh, didn't want to go into the townships because it was too dangerous and we were we were working there already and uh, base yeah I mean to make a very long story short uh, we were on parade one day and uh, the question was posed to us who wanted to be the photographer and uh, I saw it as a, as a way of uh, just doing something different and, and I've always said that if they needed a chef or a mechanic that's what I'd be doing today so it really wasn't because of my creative desire to express myself it really was just a means to an end but what a journey because I, I can't you know <laughs> just looking at your work and when I first met you and, and you sent your you know, beautiful stunning uh, you know wedding portraits and, uh, and, and everything and it's just like hmm it was amazing when you first told me that story and also the last time I think uh, which the which is on the site so if you haven't seen it you can go back and have a look at the previous webinar with Brett but I think you actually yeah. showed some images way back uh, from from when you started uh, you know in the police force so it was uh, well yeah I mean that, that was you know 20 22, 23 years ago, and and I'm actually hoping to um, to get an, ex an exhibition together. Um, I'm in in talks at the moment with a with a, a photographic museum here in Amsterdam, um, where uh, I might be doing an exhibition called uh, Brett Florence uh, in Love and War, showing some of all my old work and right up next to my new work in terms of the contrast of life. So. I don't know. I don't know if that's going to happen, but I, I really would like it to. Well, if it does, let me know because I'll come over and see. I'd love to see that. It'd be amazing, pal. Well, um, at least one person will be there. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, Brett. I'm going to hand you the screen so Thank we can. So, uh, so it's coming over. So, guys, just another reminder: any questions you have for Brett, please pop those through the question panel. Brett's going to prompt me when uh, when uh, he's going to ask me for questions, but also we've allowed time at the end. Uh, Brett, you should be getting the the request to share your screen. Yeah, I've got that, and you should be seeing my screen. Excellent. I can see it full screen. I can hear you loud and clear. It's all yours, bud. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So, good evening, everyone, and it's it really is a, a pleasure to be here. Um, just in terms of uh, being asked to speak, uh, it is, is really flattering for me, uh, considering where I have come from uh, in my life. Uh, what I would really like is a little bit of interaction, because uh, I'm sitting here alone in my office, and it is quite strange uh, just to speak to myself for, for an hour or so. So if you do have any questions or comments or uh, you want to shout out from wherever you are listening in the world, it would be really nice to, to interact, uh, obviously, via Jay. But uh, yeah, please, please do uh, just pop in any questions or uh, any comments or anything you'd like me to speak about specifically. So just to, just to kick off quickly, um, Jay has shown you my uh, social media uh, platforms that I that I use. Uh, so if you if you would like to follow me on on Facebook, on Instagram, and Twitter, uh, that would be really nice to uh, you know get in contact with you and and uh, yeah ex experience what I experience. So let's get going with what I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, yeah, destination weddings. You know, uh, destination weddings for me happened in a way um, by default because. Uh, you know, living in, in Durban in, in South Africa, uh, the market is quite small 
and uh, I think after about 10 or 15 years of working in that market, I just felt that I needed to break out of that market and, and start exploring other markets. So I started photographing weddings in Johannesburg, which is still in, um, in my country, but it's, uh, it means uh, packing gear and uh, catching a, an airplane trip to uh, a city that I didn't live in. So when you say destination weddings, I mean, we don't want, it doesn't mean that all your weddings are going to look like this. It just means that it's not in your hometown. Uh, and I think that there are a few things that we need to chat about when we talk about destination weddings because uh, it's all fair and well and it's a lovely experience and you get to see the most incredible places in the world. Um, but I, I do want to talk to you about the, the, the highs and the lows uh, of uh, photographing weddings that are not in uh, your, your hometown. Uh, this was from a wedding in, in Zanzibar, um, and as I go through, uh, you know, I'd, I'll just mention the, the areas and, the, and the, the locations that they were. This is also Zanzibar and uh, Dubai, the desert in Dubai. Obviously, that's uh, Paris. That's in the desert in, uh, in Nevada, recognizable in terms of New York and the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, so... I have shot many weddings uh, outside of uh, South Africa um, and I currently live between South Africa and Amsterdam and I know that that also might sound a little strange to people but basically I follow the seasons. So um, I spend a lot of time in South Africa when it's uh, the wedding season uh, and that would be a kind of March, April, May, the, the spring and um, uh, autumn times. So uh, March, April, May is uh, autumn beautiful weather uh, and, and quite predictable and then uh, back in, in, the, uh, in the springtime which would be September, October, November. Uh, the other times of the year uh, I would spend quite a lot of my time in, um, in Europe and I target my marketing for those specific areas around about those specific times and we'll get to marketing uh, a little later on uh, just in terms of trying to target a certain destination uh, you know, during a, during a certain season. So just to start off, uh, what I have found is that Instagram definitely gets you more work for destination weddings than other uh, social media platforms. And when I'm talking about the other social media platforms, Facebook and Twitter work fantastically for um, a certain segment of the market and also in terms of uh, promotional, uh, you know, self-promotion and, and your marketing. Uh, I'm not negating Facebook and Twitter, but Instagram specifically uh, is, is very productive when it comes to uh, destination weddings. And if you have a look at my Instagram page and my Instagram feed, um, whenever I do put up uh, work, um, I do shoot a lot of behind-the-scenes uh, imagery. Behind-the-scenes gets you more attention than uh, sometimes the actual uh, image that you produce uh, and I think it also I mean it's got nothing really to do too much with destination weddings I think it's just with wedding photography or even any photography in general if you're shooting behind the scenes work uh, or behind the scenes images it does show that you're confident in what you're doing and that you um, are uh, you know uh, in terms of in terms of knowing your your stuff you're happy to put it out there so you don't have any secrets when it comes to how you create images. Uh, so I do post a lot of behind the scenes and they do tend to get uh, a, a lot of work. Um, obviously in Instagram the hashtagging is essential when it comes to getting uh, destination work because as soon as a, a bride is uh, engaged or, or a groom is engaged uh, you, will, you will find that uh, Instagram is, is a go-to platform and then hashtag destination bride, hashtag destination wedding, uh, hashtag uh, exotic wedding. Uh, there's so many uh, different hashtags that do lead people to your, your work. Um, you can also um, hashtag work that isn't necessarily destination work, uh, but you could be trying to attract uh, brides that are getting married. For example, I, I'm assuming that a lot of people listening tonight are from the UK. Uh, there could be people that are that are uh, that that live uh, in Europe and and wanting to get married in the UK. 
and it will also, to them, it's a destination wedding. So, you know, don't uh, don't think that uh, you're only targeting people that live uh, or getting married abroad when you when you're running a destination business. I I market myself as a destination photographer, but if somebody's getting married, you know, 10 or 15 miles away from me, of course I'm going to still be shooting. Uh, you know, I'm still I'm still going to accept the accept the job. So, what are the ways to target uh, destination clients? Uh, one of one of those ways is is really to get yourself in front of those people. You're going to need to get yourself uh, to the to the source of the well. So if I look at percentage-wise, um, I heard a statistic and, and I followed it up at the time that 42% of people that get married in England get married abroad. Uh, when I say people that get married in, in England, people from England that get married, 42% get married abroad. Now that is a huge chunk of people that are getting married outside of the UK. and uh, having done some research, I found that it was because engagements are so very long, because uh, wedding venues are difficult to get to get hold of. Uh, uh, in terms of vendors, if you want to have the, the correct, perfect storm of of uh, uh, suppliers uh, in your uh, for your specific wedding, then to get that to get that all, you know, to work in, in terms of the jigsaw puzzle. Um, might mean that you, you might have to be engaged for two years or two and a half years. And also statistically, it's also found that uh, people in the UK break off their weddings uh, more than uh, people in other countries where engagements are actually shorter, uh, you know, because obviously they're caught up in the, in the flurry of getting, um, getting married. And if you're only engaged for eight months, you have less time to, to, to back out of it. So, I mean, you know, just in terms of um, uh, destinations, destination weddings, it is a shorter lead time. So people that book me often will be getting married within the next six months or the eight eight months. It's not it's not really a two year or, or a two and a half year engagement session. So one of the things that I do is I go to the source of uh, my clientele, and and for example, this year I did a, a bridal fair uh, at. Uh, um, at the at the at brides the show, and as you can see, there is my um, there's there's my luggage, my whole luggage allocation. Uh, I brought my clothes over in in the, my hand luggage, and that's really what I put in the hold. Uh, in the longer uh, carton there, there is a floor, which I'll show you in a sec, and then the backdrop to my stand. So there's there's a floor, uh, which obviously is desert sand, and uh, there I am opening up the the backdrop. Uh, putting the the uh, sign behind me, uh, and I did steam it. So those people who are worrying about the uh, the creases and the wrinkles, I borrowed a steamer, much to the horror of the health and safety officials, uh, and uh, I steamed the uh, the canvas backdrop uh, to produce uh, the the table that uh, or my stand, uh, which was very specific in terms of targeting people that are getting married abroad. And having that image there did generate a lot of interest, um, obviously because it's it's completely alien to the uh, to the UK public, uh, not really expecting to to see something like that. The the brochures that I had uh, made in terms of my uh, my giveaways for the for the client to take away, uh, it was in keeping with my backdrop. And those of you who who follow my teaching. They'll know what I'm talking about where uh, I talk about how to exhibit at a, at a bridal show or a bridal fair. So just to, just to help people who uh, don't know or, or wouldn't, uh, who haven't uh, exhibited at a bridal uh, stand uh, before or a bridal fair, I'm not going to go through it uh, too much here in detail. I will be doing it at my, my talk um, uh, at the, the society's convention, but basically it cost me around five thousand pounds to exhibit at uh, Brides the show. Obviously, for people who live there, uh, you know the, the the travel aspect of it isn't going to be as great. But in in, in total, it cost me you know around uh, around five thousand pounds for seventeen hours <laughs> worth of uh, exhibition time. Uh, 
it, it, it can be it can seem to be quite expensive, but the rewards are, are really great. Uh, you know, you're not gonna you're not going to uh, attract people who are getting married abroad if you constantly have the same uh, work on your website and you're merely telling people that you're a destination photographer. This is showing people that I'm a destination wedding photographer and as you've heard so many times, you need to show what you want to sell. So I advertise at bridal fairs. Um, I, I've, I put adverts in uh, Brides magazine um, which is obviously a UK uh, publication and it is, it's there to, to really uh, attract uh, clients who are potentially looking to, to getting uh, married abroad. So, I mean, with, with regards to the rest of the marketing side of things, I, I don't have uh, as much time to talk about it now, uh, but I would still be doing my Facebook campaigns, my Twitter uh, campaigns, uh, very specifically on, on Instagram. Uh, and uh, in terms of the marketing, I definitely have to show on my site, on my Facebook, uh, that I am a destination uh, wedding photographer. I'll talk to you about that if we have, a, if we have time in a, in a couple of minutes. Uh, but just in the meantime, are there any questions that are out there, Joe? Uh, yeah, a few came through, but you, you actually, uh, the first sort of questions that came through were uh, about how to market yourself as a destination yeah. photographer, so you kind of tick the boxes straight off the bat. Um, right. Interestingly, just coming through the, the last few, so I kind of, because I deleted them out as you were answering them, um, yeah. but um, obviously you've talked about, and, and you're saying that predominantly uh, people, you, you, the audience that you think, you know, we're them online with us now are UK. Yes, I would say 70% yeah. of our viewers are usually in the UK. So you've okay. you, you've shown us, obviously, that you came over to the Brides show here in the UK yes. and that you advertise in Brides magazine. Where else yeah. Where else in the world are you actually so, advertising? Brides? All right. So, uh, well, I, I advertise for, for the Middle East um, because there's a lot of expats that uh, work in the Middle East. Uh, and uh, you do find that a Canadian will uh, fall in love with an Australian and the center meeting place is Dubai. So all the family, it's, it's easiest for the family to, to meet at that central point. Uh, you'll get, uh, I mean, I could mention all the countries where you've got uh, people from the UK who now live in Dubai and they've fallen in love with someone from Argentina. And it's really a, a central hub where most people can get to quite easily. Uh, also, it's, it's, it's a unique destination, so people like getting married there because they can show off where their, their adopted home is. So basically, I've been telling you my targeting in terms of uh, targeting the UK market who is getting married abroad. So when I go to the show, I'm not targeting people that are getting married in the UK. I mean, I, I know that you've, you've understood that, but if you specifically want to go and target weddings in Italy, you know, first of all, you need to make sure that uh, you're targeting uh, people uh, that have disposable income because it costs you a lot more uh, in terms of your, uh, cap, your own capital outlay to photograph weddings abroad. So if you want to go and shoot weddings, specifically say, you know, in Lake Como, uh, then it's going to it's going to be a little different, and you you're going to go to where those weddings are going to take place. So if you want to shoot in France, go to go to uh, wedding fairs in France. But I really think that the most important thing there was is to be able to speak the language, because if you go to uh, France or Italy, and you you're standing there uh, selling your services, one of the reasons why I'm successful is because I speak English. So Having uh, me going to a, a bridal fair in England, uh, I'm hopefully targeting English people that are getting married in Italy, in Spain, uh, in wherever, in Croatia, in Turkey, wherever. Uh, and, and having someone that can communicate in English, I think, is essential in terms of the photographer because there's so many nuances when it comes to, to posing and to, to, to instruction and to articulating to a client what, you, what you're looking for. Brilliant. I get that fully. That's fantastic. Um, so obviously you just showed us um, another question that we'll, we'll definitely ask now. It's worth asking now. Obviously you showed us the breakdown yeah. of what the, the bride show cost. Um, yeah. Obviously 
from from what you're saying you know it was worth the expense but obviously you've also built you know you've you've built a strong business for yourself you know is that the kind of averages are they the kind of cost pretty much most most places for that sort of thing mate yes it is it is uh, that that is kind of uh, the the cost um uh you know that's for a 2 by 3 meter stand uh, you could obviously go bigger you could go smaller but i just think just in terms of uh, people taking you seriously i think it's the right size i think if you go bigger uh, you, it's going to cost you a lot more money, and for me, it's just worked out uh, to be the right to be the right size. And I mean, it's expensive, Jay. It's not. It's still a risk, mate. It, it doesn't oh, mean for sure. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 It, and just speaking to people for 15 minutes, and you're thinking, oh, these people are never going to book me. Just move on, because that that you know that conversation just cost me 40 pounds. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you were, yeah. Yeah. Per minute. <laughs> You know, so, so, so yeah, um, but but building up a reputation, I think that that's irrelevant. I think you could go and exhibit at uh, at a bridal fair without having a reputation. That's another conversation. But I don't think that you need. Uh, I think it just. I think that if you can back it up by solid work uh, and and having uh, you know the, the the right collateral with you, um, I don't think that you have to have you know. 15 years experience in terms of destination weddings but sure. that's a whole nother conversation. Sure. Well I think you just show just from that stand alone you know the impact you know we, we, we just saw it as a, a collection of stills behind the scenes but you know even yeah. that small space you made it you, you owned it you made it yours um, and, it, and it stood out so I, I get that fully. Uh, nice question here Brett before before we let you move on uh, a fellow yeah. uh, uh, from a fellow South African um, how did you make the change? <laughs> how did you make the change to wedding photography, and how long did it take to get your first paid wedding? Uh, my, my my first well, it happened when I was a policeman, uh, and it happens to a lot of people uh, where you you start shooting for friends and family. But I can just cut you off right there. Do not do that. Do not shoot for friends and family, uh, because what's going to happen is you're going to end up shooting for those people for for a very long time because you get yourself into a certain market and <laughs> what I what I learned after about 10 years is that I am not my target market because I did not have disposable income uh, so you are shooting for people uh, that are of the same social ilk as you and have the same disposable income as you which is nothing so Shooting for friends and family, not a great route to go. I, I had been shooting for about 10 or 15 years and I started to build up uh, a, a legitimate business and I was shooting 50, 60 weddings a year and I was just like, I cannot do this anymore. So uh, I, I was fortunate to um, uh, have shot film for, for a very long time and the, the change from film to digital was not only a photographic revolution, but also it coincided with the information revolution. Uh, you know, and and we had access to training. And I started following uh, photographers and listening to their marketing strategies and implemented that, and then changed my business plan from hot dogs to fine dining uh, in about two years. And then I started targeting a more affluent client, and yeah, haven't looked back since. It, it's it's very difficult to shoot for the middle market or for friends and family, mate. But that, again, a whole nother can of worms. Oh, for sure. I've, I, I don't do <laughs> weddings, and the only weddings I've done are for friends and family, and I will yeah. will never do it again. They don't have money either, right? <laughs> no, absolutely not. <laughs> I, will ne I, I will never do it again. Uh, you know, so, yeah. no, my hat's off to you on yeah. that. Now, the rest of the questions we're going to hang on to, so you crack on, mate, cool. and what, what you cool. got ready right. on your next one. Okay. Sure, sure, sure. So, uh, when it comes to uh, charging the client, um, I made this mistake right in the beginning where uh, you decide that, oh, this is so cool that I'm going to be shooting a destination wedding and you, you're quite flattered by the, by the idea and, and uh, you know, you're ready to hop onto a plane and uh, you just say to the client, look, pay my, uh, my airfare and my accommodation and I'm going to charge you uh, what I normally charge you because just the validation for you is, is, is payment enough. Uh, over and above what uh, it would usually cost you uh, to to uh, to photograph a wedding, but there are so many additional things that you need to think about. Um, obviously, flights. Uh, you know, the the client is going to put you if you if the client is paying uh, for you to come along, 
Uh, you're going to have luggage restrictions. You're going to have uh, you're going to be flying at, at the completely the wrong time of the day. So I always make sure that I'm in charge of my travel and accommodation um, uh, requirements, so that uh, I know that uh, I uh, I will have my own car. Uh, or I will be catching Ubers or something like that. I don't want to be reliant on the brother-in-law who's the last to leave at, at the wedding. You know, it's just it's not going to happen. So, uh, you know, you've got to look at extra baggage, extra baggage allowance when it comes to uh, your your uh, your gear. Uh, then there's then there's customs and how you're going to get the album to the client. Uh, you know, with regards to a courier. Uh, to, to get the printed products uh, and fortunately for both of us Jay we, we are both uh, supported by Loxley Color which uh, <laughs> I think is pretty cool but but yeah if you're going to get your printed products uh, to to uh, your client uh, Loxley Color for me uh, they courier uh, all over the world which is a, it's a great service um, for, for that and <laughs> when I say clothing you know if you live in a warm country and you're going to go and shoot a wedding in a cold country you might not have the clothing that that uh, you need, and you get there and suddenly need you need to go and buy a jacket, or you need to buy and go, go and buy gloves. And <laughs> I mean this, I mean this in the the least condescending way possible. If you're only earning fifteen hundred pounds uh, from that wedding, your your take home pay is only four hundred and thirty anyway. So you don't have the disposable income to go and buy you know a pair of gloves or a, or a jacket or uh, stuff that that you weren't specifically uh, thinking about, like you know uh, tra travel adapters for for your charging, um, uh, charging your phones and your your, and then you always leave uh, a charger or a, a a cord in the in the hotel room or something like that. Then you need to look at communication. You need to buy SIM cards. All sorts of things that really need to be thought about before you uh, go ahead and and uh, charge the client. And you know, it, it's. I know that it sounds strange, but it's lonely, and I and I don't want sympathy from anyone because I've chosen to do this. But you know, it's lonely. You end up in hotel rooms, uh, you know, with three or four hours to spare, and you know, you you don't. I don't personally need anything more. So for me to go shopping on my own is not really that attractive. And I spend a lot of my time uh, in in airport, uh, you know, departure lounges. Waiting for waiting for planes uh, to take off, and you know, sit there, and then suddenly you're you're delayed, and you know, you, you end up in 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 an airport uh, at two in the morning with a with a four hour layover um, or something like that. So, you know, there are frustrations and there are challenges, uh, and it's it, it's not as um, glamorous as travel isn't as glamorous as as it as it sounds. Um, one of the things that I think is really important is to quote in the currency. Uh, of the country that you that you are going to, uh, <laughs> in South Africa we are um, susceptible to currency fluctuation quite a lot. And not to bring up too many sore points, but I can see that you guys are also battling with uh, your currency at the moment too. So, uh, you know, quote in a, in a currency that you that you're going, uh, you know, if you if you're photographing uh, a wedding uh, in in Italy uh, or in in Dubai or or in the States. You know, quote in the currency that uh, that you're going to be shooting in, because a lot of the places that you, um, you know, in terms of gear rental, if you're going to rent gear, uh, you need to find out those prices before you get there, which would which would mean that uh, you know, if you do have currency fluctuations, then then you're covered uh, for that as well. And I have I have um, had situations where uh, I quoted in in a local currency. And ended up uh, losing, you know, 15, 20 percent, uh, and that's pure profit that that you are losing. So, once you've done your marketing, once you've done your quoting, and uh, you, you've you've uh, got the job, the first thing that I do, and I do this for all my weddings anyway, is to uh, accept uh, their, you know, accept their uh, friend requests on on Facebook, or to to. Uh, uh, ask them to to be your friend uh, on social media so that you can uh, uh, learn a lot about them. Uh, this particular bride is getting was getting married in uh, Dubai, and I uh, saw uh, you know I, I had a uh, quite a big window uh, in terms of a glimpse into her lifestyle and and what she was about. Fortunately for me, 
you know, I travel uh, back and forth from Europe to South Africa quite a lot, and I go through Dubai, and uh, I took uh, a, a longer layover. I took about a, a, an eight or nine hour layover uh, between my uh, airplanes, uh, you know, going from uh, Dubai to Durban, and I met her at, uh, at uh, a coffee shop. This was at Magnolia Bakery, and I had taken uh, mood boards with me uh, of the proposed engagement shoot that uh, that I was going to do uh, with her, and we sat there and had one of the most expensive cupcakes that I have ever had in my life. Uh, but acting as if uh, I do this every day, <laughs> and uh, obviously I'm absorbing the costs uh, of that. But yeah, it it was quite an expensive uh, experience that. Uh, and those are the kind of things that you might not necessarily have taken into account where you decide to embark on uh, a destination wedding photography journey. So just to take you through very quickly the kind of things that I, I would do with her, because I know uh, that Dubai is a, is a beach type of environment, that was one of the mood boards. Uh, I know that uh, sailing or, or going out into the du Dubai um, marina is quite a big thing. So I thought that that would work quite appropriately. And then obviously the nightlife is uh, is really cool in Dubai and you've got a lot of these uh, cityscapes in the background. So that's what I proposed to her for her engagement session and then because we're in Dubai I, I proposed that we do a shoot in the desert uh, afterwards uh, with, with, uh, with a camel uh, and <laughs> that was the point where she told me that her fiance was actually a camel vet. I kid you not, she was a, he is a camel vet as you are in Dubai. <laughs> so right, what do you do to get assistance? So very easy, reach out on Facebook. Uh, somebody will know somebody living uh, in, in a certain area. Or you could go onto the uh, society's uh, website and look for photographers pretty much all over the world, connect with them, and find out if you could get uh, assistance uh, to work for you. So this was uh, the wedding that I did was in uh, March. And this, uh, this was in November when I started to ask for, for an assistant and then to also ask about the ins and outs of shooting uh, in a foreign country because um, you know, it, it, you, there can be rules and regulations, especially, for example, in a Middle Eastern country where uh, you know, it might not be as, as uh, it is back home. So apply for my visa. Uh, I get my visa and one of the first things that I learned about shooting in the Middle East or shooting in Dubai is that to shoot anywhere similarly to uh, being in, um, in in major cities such as uh, you know Paris or Milan or Amsterdam or London is that you need to have permits to work there but I am officially not allowed to work there uh, because I'm not going to get a work permit or a work visa for one wedding so I had to work uh, through Bernie. The, that was the, the guy who you saw earlier on that I connected with on Facebook. So technically he was kind of like my fixer and he would um, do all the paperwork under his name and uh, you know then um, uh, I would be technically working uh, for him uh, and that did avoid any, uh, any legalities with regards to visas uh, or, or anything like that. Pretty easy to rent a boat. Uh, went on to Groupon and rented a boat uh, for the shoot because I knew that uh, I was going to generate quite a lot of um, uh, interest from from the shoot, and I could put work out there that was going to attract other clients, just like uh, these ones as well. So, for their engagement session, uh, there we are, just about to shoot the engagement session, and I'm going to take you very quickly through. What I did uh, for them, uh, you know, very simply, probably the same kind of thing that most photographers do for an engagement session. But then I, I like to step it up a bit, uh, take it to to another level where I'm introducing a bit of a fashion uh, element to it as well. And right over here, uh, I've got my mood board for my second uh, look, and we went out for a boat cruise, uh, two-hour boat cruise, and shot some images for the second chapter of the engagement session and uh, this is leading on to the third chapter obviously where uh, I, I uh, did a bit of a night shoot 
uh, in, in Dubai just to reflect their, uh, their lifestyle uh, in Dubai. Um, a week or so after the, the wedding, uh, sorry, a week or so after the engagement, obviously I, I blog uh, that, uh, I, I blog the, the, the wedding, uh, sorry, I blog the engagement, my thoughts are, are, are going somewhere else here, and you can see that I generate quite a lot of interest from that. I mean, uh, okay, 90 people liked it, but nearly 20,000 people reach because it's not your stereotypical engagement shoot, and it and it does it is different in terms of the the location. So it does generate uh, quite a lot of um, of interest. So what I wanted to to add just at this point here is things like if you are going on holiday to a to a certain city uh, and you're going somewhere abroad, seriously go and get a dress. From, from a wedding dress from a, from a, a dressmaker, uh, a dress designer, uh, rent a dress or offer people uh, images in return for, for that and this shot here I did when I was on holiday in, in, in Dubai um, and when I say on holiday in Dubai it was uh, because I had worked for a hotel group and I would got a trade exchange in return for uh, the work that I had done and I went on holiday with my wife to Dubai and I used one of the days to, uh, to take this shot and this shot here booked me three weddings in Dubai and I think that the, the client that I've just shown you came from having seen uh, this particular image. Uh, I was in New York on another trip and I had an Enzoni gown with me. Uh, you can see that that's very easily put into, into my luggage and yeah, off I went and shot by a recognizable uh, structure under the Brooklyn Bridge and now I've got work that makes my work look and attract destination uh, clients. Right, day of the wedding, uh, first problem that happened was he had to go and work uh, on the day of his wedding. Uh, there was a camel that was uh, not feeling too well and was racing uh, the next day, so we couldn't shoot in the location that uh, uh, we wanted to shoot in, which ended up meaning that we had to shoot on the beach and we had permissions issues and I had to uh, fork out probably about 80 pounds to the beach tennis guy to let us play for 15 minutes, uh, six or seven of us uh, playing beach tennis. So we weren't going to play beach tennis, they were going to go jet skiing somewhere else, but that had to be cancelled because of timing issues. And then the rest of the wedding pretty much would be the way that I would shoot uh, a wedding. Um, yeah, just, you know, I'm, I'm shooting it the way I would usually shoot a, a wedding uh, in South Africa. Uh, I know that you don't really get too many outdoor weddings uh, like this uh, in the UK, but, you know, sometimes you do in the summer. Uh, and, yeah, just having a look at uh, how it all goes down there. I'm going through this quite quickly because this is irrelevant to uh, the story of destination weddings. But what I wanted to tell you here was what I do for most weddings is um, I photograph couples as they're entering uh, into the reception area and then print and frame on the day for guests to take away with them. And here now you've got to just understand what a huge cosmopolitan uh, uh, client target market you have. So if you do get a destination wedding, do as much as you can to, uh, even if you do it at cost, say to people, look, we'll, we'll do photographs of people entering uh, the reception and we'll print on, on site as well. Um, then speeches. Uh, I do a same day slideshow, the, the, they, they were watching a same day slideshow, that works amazingly well too because uh, you know obviously again you've got people from all over the world uh, seeing your work uh, and, and yeah it's just, uh, I mean it's just in terms of the marketing value is just absolutely huge. So uh, a couple days later, oh <laughs> we're supposed, this wedding was on a, on a Friday and we were supposed to shoot the uh, post-wedding session on a Sunday and uh, again he had to go and work and they said okay oh, we postpone until the Tuesday. 
and my flight had already been booked. I had to change a flight, which cost me another 280 pounds. And again, if you haven't budgeted for it, it's not going to be fun when uh, you, you know you can't say to a client, "Oh, sorry, um, I have to leave," uh, when they have spent quite a lot of money getting you there. So factoring in uh, flight changes and things like that could be uh, could be uh, a factor. And if you've gone super budget on your airline, you won't be able to change that flight. You're going to lose out. So maybe booking a flight that is a little bit flexible is not a is not a bad option. Um, so these are the images that we created. Well, from that we uh, photoshopped a few people out and ended up with uh, that image there. Uh, another shot and. You know, obviously, you don't get those kind of images uh, every day. Uh, this is just a screen grab from uh, Harper's Bazaar, so that's why it is a little bit uh, pixelated. And because you've got work that looks so different and uh, really alien to, to most uh, viewers, uh, I was fortunate enough for this uh, particular wedding to be featured in uh, Harper's Bazaar magazine. Uh, and then, yeah, just in terms of my post-production, it would be, oh, sorry, uh, also uh, the people that made the flowers, the bouquet here, used my images uh, in, uh, in their advertising in bridal magazines too. So I'm, I'm getting more credibility and more uh, weight uh, behind them as well. So here it is where I am uh, getting her to approve her album design. Uh, I use uh, smart albums and basically... Uh, I uh, upload to uh, the online proofing. She does it uh, through, uh, you know, the online system, and everything gets approved. And uh, what we do here, and I think this is not necessarily about destination weddings, but I uh, try and make sure that I can get as many albums out of clients as possible. So this client specifically uh, for. Bridesmaids albums, four groomsmen's albums, two parents albums. Uh, I think in total I must have delivered 15, 16 albums uh, to, to these clients with very bespoke uh, imagery. You can see here that I've got a, a note from them at the end of the, uh, of the album. And here is, here's what I'm delivering to them. And uh, Loxley Color uh, couriered all those products uh, to my fixer, <laughs> uh, Bernie, uh, in Dubai. And just to throw in another uh, spanner into the works here, I had to pay 1,554 dirham uh, import duties, which I wasn't expecting. Uh, that works out to probably about 320 pounds, uh, which again, I wasn't expecting, and I had to uh, absorb uh, that, that, that cost. Uh, traveling through Dubai, again, uh, you could deliver straight to the client if you wanted to, but uh, I was, uh, you know, like I said, I'm back and forth uh, through the through the con uh, through the city all the time. And when I say through the city, I really just mean in transit. So I do take uh, an extra, uh, you know, 14 or 15 hours just to get out into the city, meet people that I need to meet, and then get back to the airport. And I uh, delivered the album uh, to her. Uh, and uh, I think this is quite funny because she was having a, a great time and I was just thinking about how much the drinks were costing. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, just in terms of everything that, that I've done with regards to this particular wedding, I, um, I documented everything that I, that I uh, did and uh, I actually written a book. Uh, specifically on this wedding, it's called uh, One Wedding Destination Dubai, and it's basically how I photograph one entire wedding, like right from the beginning, in terms of even uh, meeting the client, talking about uh, my technique when you get the first email from her, uh, right through to the, the, the engagement session, the wedding, the post-wedding session, the post-production, and the delivery uh, of, of the albums. Uh, but before I do that, uh, I have three or four minutes to answer some questions uh, before we before we start to uh, head on down to to wrapping it up. So, Jay. Yes, Bill. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> well, I've got a lot of questions for you. They're not in any particular sure, order, sure. Uh, but you have offered. Okay. Uh, you've answered quite a lot as you go, as I know you always do, which is good. So I, I've kind of stripped Excellent. out. But 
kept a few. Um, okay, so this was quite an interesting one. Uh, obviously, when working, um, you know, at different destinations, what are the sort of legal things that you come across a lot? You know, I think you mentioned about having to pay shooting costs. Is that quite common? Um, uh, yeah, shooting, you know, uh, whenever people think that if you go and shoot in Paris that you just walk up to the Eiffel Tower and go and take photographs. As soon as you, as soon as you put a, a tripod down, or as soon as you bring out a big camera, they they stop you. If they can, they you know, you can argue until you're blue in the face with regards to saying that what difference does it make if I've got a cell phone or if it. But at the end of the day, it's their city and it's their rules, and they can they can stop you. So, I research the legalities of that as as um, as much as possible, and then I do hustle. I do try and you know, if they chase me away, I've got my shots already. Uh, um, with regards to to photographing um, in in the the United Arab Emirates, um, uh, there there are rules and and regulations, and I do investigate that, and and I do that via the photographer that I'm speaking to. Uh, you you know, if you do look on websites, uh, sometimes they they uh, get a little exaggerated in what you can and what you can't do. Dubai is such a gorgeous place to visit. It's an amazing city. It's dynamic. So many people think, oh, you know, that, that ladies can't wear uh, shorts or ladies can't wear revealing tops. Now, it's just a matter of respect, really. I mean, you, you, you're not going to walk around the shopping mall in a bikini, uh, but uh, it's not as, it's not as, um, as uh, conservative as, as, people, as people think. Uh, if you are doing something that uh, is not appropriate, people generally tell you in a very friendly way. So, uh, you know, just re with regards to learning about the city or learning about the culture, I always ask photographers in that area uh, for, for advice. Um, uh, and again, uh, just on Facebook or through the society's website to, to uh, find photographers in, in different areas. Then the legality side of things, you know, visas. You're not going to get a you're not going to get a working visa to go. And if you if you're not from the UK, you're not going to get a working visa to go and shoot a wedding in the UK. It's it's just not going to happen. So either you try and wing it, uh, going in as a as a tourist, and it's entirely your own risk, or you go in and technically the job is uh, for somebody else, and you're going in as a second shooter uh, for a friend and and. Uh, the payment needs to go through them, and you know, you, again, you are taking a risk, uh, but that really is dependent on 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 you and your, uh, not necessarily your morals, but uh, the way you the way you want uh, to run your business. And then there are some countries which they really don't even care. Uh, Zanzibar, for one, uh, you got Southeast Asia, where you know it, the, the, the rules are pretty much non-existent. So. You know, to go and shoot weddings in Southeast Asia is absolutely gorgeous, uh, and yeah, to 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 photograph in public places in Zanzibar was an absolute breeze. It really wasn't a problem. So, so do your homework, basically. Do your homework and then evaluate the risks. You know, uh, you know, the chances of the chances of getting stopped at customs. Uh, with, a, with a bag load of gear, uh, if you're going to a country where you know that they're going to check and they know you're going to ask questions, then rather rent gear on the other side. Brilliant. Don't go in with don't go in with your uh, your 70 to 200 2.8 and your D5 and three flashes and a whole big you know camera you know uh, you know cargo plane full of gear. Rather rent uh, uh, on the other side. So look for rental houses. Some places won't. Uh, there, there won't be places to rent, but I rented gear myself for this wedding in Dubai. Uh, there's a there's a, a studio in Dubai called Lighthouse Studio, and I rented gear from them. Brilliant. Um, speaking, I think you just touched on it briefly there, but uh, somebody yeah. just asked uh, out of your own experiences, obviously not as a as a woman, but in the Middle East, are there restrictions <laughs> on uh, on female photographers that you're aware of, or do you just, as oh, you said, respect that? Respect uh, if you if you no, no, no. If you're going to photograph uh, 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 an Arabic uh, wedding, then you, it's much better to be female. Uh, um, they, they have got quite, quite um, uh, strict rules in place with regards to uh, a male photographing a female, but that would really be uh, a people, the people that are local to, to the, the region. So I don't target uh, the locals there, I target expats. 
So I wouldn't get uh, a, a wedding in, in that country that was uh, Ara uh, Arabic, if that's the right pronunciation. I'm with you. I'm with you. Uh, I think you kind of answered this next question, but I kept it for a reason, because obviously you were talking about, we've talked a lot about, you know, the hidden costs and, uh, yeah. you know, be prepared. So the question that came in really was, are you actually just quoting them a, a, a complete fee or, or where does yeah. that, and what does that include? And, you know, are the extra albums part of it or is there a separate price list for that? Yeah. Well, I would still, uh, I would still offer them uh, four different options. I, I have four different options in the collections that I offer my clients, uh, and I would still include those, uh, uh, but obviously uh, they would include all my uh, my uh, estimated costs and my anticipated costs uh, as well. Uh, so yeah, it would be exactly the same as the way I would quote for a local wedding, uh, just it would be different pricing, and uh, I don't even mention travel and accommodation because it's not really the clients, unless, unless obviously I'm photographing a somebody who is uh, in my country and we're both going to the same uh, destination. I mean, then I would say, yes, obviously uh, everything's included, but the client assumes that everything's included anyway. So, uh, you know, f and I'm talking about my, my clients. If a client emails me and says, hi there, I'm getting married in, uh, in New Yorker, please can you send me a quote? Uh, I send them a quote and, uh, you know, maybe I might mention uh, it's an all-inclusive quote. Brilliant. So I, I don't, I don't say, I don't say travel and uh, accommodation excluded, uh, because yeah, that could just lead to conflict and arguments and things that I'm not really interested in. So a couple of people asked, obviously, because you mentioned that you split your time primarily between South Africa and obviously the Netherlands. Um, yeah. So when you're quoting, are you quoting just generally in euro, or you know, and that's what they pay and they work out the currency conversion? Uh, I, I quote for the couple, uh, if, they, if they're getting married in Italy, I quote in Euro. If they're getting married in South Africa, I quote in Rand. If they're getting married in the UK, I quote in Pounds. If they're getting married in, the, the, in Dubai, I quote in Dollars. So, but again, comes back down to your homework and, you know, making it yes. as easy as possible for yes. the client. Brilliant. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. Obviously, we've been seeing, and you've given us a, a nice sort of a few behind-the-scenes shots, but a couple of people asked about uh, how you deal with the bright sunlight, and I noticed sort of the Ellen Crumb quadras and some of you behind-the-scenes there. So typically, typically what you're taking with you? I think that must be Justine from Ellen Crumb Marketing. Who's asking. <laughs> no, no, the German's called Mark, unless he's in disguise. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. <laughs> Hi, Mark. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, for, for me, the Quadra is very light and versatile, and it's, uh, I mean, I put it in my, in my clothing luggage. I, 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 maybe I should put it in, maybe if my insurance company is listening, maybe they, I shouldn't be saying that, but I don't, uh, I, I put it into my suitcase. So it's light enough to go. It's light enough to go in there, or I rent on the other side. And yeah, it's it's yeah dealing with dealing with the sunlight uh, in a in a in a country like this is obviously um, important to have the right gear. Oh, the quadras are amazing. You know, again, it's easy for me to say, but they're an incredible piece of kit. And like you said, the light, the, the weight of them has has come down so much. It's uh, it's it's fantastic to travel with. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, well, this sort of this ties in nicely actually to the last question. It just happens to be the next one on the list. Uh, so you talked yeah. briefly about it, the question was about traveling with kit. So um, uh, is the, is your kit going through the hold, or are you taking it on board predominantly? What what's when you are taking kit with you, obviously? Uh, lenses and cameras, uh, uh, lenses, cameras, and also uh, hard drives uh, come with me on on board, and the rest goes in the hold. And when I say the rest goes in the hold. That would be things like uh, my LED panels. I use the, the Rotolite panel, so the LEDs would go in the hold. Um, uh, the Quadra. Uh, if I've got um, a small stand, I will take that. I've got the Ellen Crom, uh, not Ellen Crom, Manfrotto, quite a small stand that I, that I take with me. Uh, otherwise, I, I rent on the other side. It's cheap to rent, mate. It, you know, even if you look at <laughs> and I'm pushing the, the, my mates at the flash center, but uh, even renting in your own country is not such a bad idea, you know. Renting oh, here is not, not, not a bad way to go. Mark's not allowed to have the uh, the Allen Chrome SF, uh, FS30, you know, the spotlight, and he because he, uh, oh, yeah. Debbie won't let it. 
but uh, we've actually worked out she's actually starting to think about the amount of times that we've rented it she might have been better off letting him buy it to be honest but it is one yeah. of the more expensive pieces of kit but you're right it is that. it is but, but it's just like a house right oh, rent right. until it makes financial sense to buy absolutely it, i mean if you just look at if you want to be a destination photographer uh, just to go to a bridal fair is five thousand pounds you know so so you know, it, it's, it, it makes sense that you, instead of spending, you know, 15, 20K on, on equipment, maybe use it for marketing and, and um, get yourself to a cool destination, shoot some images and uh, put them up on your site to get the work because, you know, hanging around waiting for someone to, to email you to say, let's go and shoot a, a wedding in, in Tuscany, it's not really going to happen. You, you have to actively go out and, and uh, pursue that. Oh, absolutely no that's a great bit of advice there um somebody mentioned uh, you mentioned it briefly and i think they weren't sure what it was you talked about the album design and that you you proof with a, a, a smart albums and somebody asked what was smart albums i presume that's similar to what we use we use something called uh, i can't remember what mark uses now but it's it's a service it's a software service right it's like an album it's, it's, design. It's, it's, yeah. it's a it's a it's a it's by a cups company called pixel U, and it's uh, if you just google smart albums 2 you'll you'll find it it's it's that's the name of the 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 um, album design software. Brilliant. Um, I guess again we kind of might have touched on this already. One of the other questions is a bit further down the list. Do you have different rates for different countries, or is that just an is it just the fact of what it's going to cut? You know, is it your rate for the wedding, no matter who the couple is, but then obviously the destination. Does that affect the quote? Uh, if it's uh, yeah, because sometimes weddings uh, will be a whole weekend affair. Sometimes it's two people uh, eloping. Uh, sometimes it's a thousand people uh, at the wedding. So I do look at each wedding individually and give as custom quote as I can. So it's not uh, I have a I have a, a structure that I work to. So I don't have I don't make a completely unique custom quote for each wedding. But I evaluate each wedding and uh, then do a do a quote accordingly. Well, I, I think again the the next question we're getting to, we're getting through most of them now actually, Brett. But the, okay. the question came in about cultures. I know we've talked a lot tonight about so predominantly you're dealing with ex, ex, expats. Uh, obviously, yeah. there'll be some co cross culture there possibly in the couples. So again, is it just doing your homework with regards to the cultures and the photography for that particular wedding? Well, yes, it is, but it's also uh, it's not that much different. <laughs> Oh gosh, I'm going to offend some people, but it's not that much different to the culture in London and the culture in Manchester. These sure. these different cultures, right? Sure. You're just going to learn how different people interact with the, and, and I think just, it just goes back down to uh, being really respectful and polite to 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 other people, and uh, you will attract the people that you have on your site. So you're not going to get a Chinese wedding. Uh, if you don't have that kind of work on your site, although I have shot Chinese women, but you, you know what I mean. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I uh, do. It's not. Yeah. So, so uh, I think the cultural aspect. Uh, um, it's going to if if it's going to be a huge um, a culture shock for you, it's probably going to be a huge culture shock for many of the guests, and you're all just going to enjoy the experience anyway. Brilliant. I thought this was an interesting question because we know obviously we've got some fellow South Africans online with us tonight and uh, Roxy's just asked another question. Um, so she knows, Hi, the, she knows the limits of uh, traveling, say, with a South African passport. So do you tend to actually use an international passport? Is that easier? I'm on a South African passport. Oh, there you go. Okay, brilliant. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, and, and much like you looking like it, oh, yeah, I just, I just clocked Roxy chipped in earlier that like you, she's actually living in Sweden. So you all seem to, <laughs> to, to favor get into, Scandin get into most places. Excellent. Um, okay, brilliant. Um, okay, this was interesting. Got the last few that are coming through. Um, in yeah. your recent article in Professional uh, Photo Professional Magazine, so you got we got yes. some we got some fans here, Brett. Uh, you oh. mentioned that you send the clients a photo a week to prevent too many inquiries regarding the status of the album. Is there any kind of system to this, or are you sending them in any kind of order, or is it just you know just a taste? Uh, I do that with all my clients anyway, whether it's destination or not. That's that's all about emotional fulfillment and keeping clients emotionally hungry. Uh, you know, um, 
a lot of photographers tend to move on to the next job as soon as one uh, job is finished uh, and I just like to keep my clients emotionally hungry and uh, I don't want to emotionally fulfill them uh, by giving them a whole lot of images uh, at once so probably a week or so after uh, the wedding uh, once I've done an initial 10 or 15 image uh, blog uh, I will send an image to the client saying I'm just busy with your album and um, uh, I came across this, this, this image that I thought that you would really like uh, which means that <laughs> I hope I don't have any brides listening uh, which means that she leaves me alone for another week or so. <laughs> Brilliant. I love it. Absolutely love it. Okay, last couple of questions. Um, how many how many weddings are you doing a year? Uh, between 10 and 15. Excellent. And uh, do you do all your own editing or do you use uh, retouches? I outsource all my editing. Uh, I have uh, two or three retouches that I use, uh, uh, freelance retouches that have worked for me for since we went digital um, and uh, depending on the, the workload uh, I will either use all three or just one specifically I don't do any of my re of my own retouching but I do do my own album design brilliant um, and how long roughly then um, does it take you to deliver six the finished weeks. album six to eight weeks perfect yeah. Okay, well, that's, that's all of the questions, Brett. Thank you so much again for joining us tonight. Uh...